need any introduction. Certainly, those of you who read in the areas of mental health law, uh, Ian is incredibly productive. Uh, his bio says he's um, published um, over 40 books. Uh, the books like the standard five volume text on the rules of evidence and small matters like that. He is remarkably uh, productive. Uh, the editor of Psychiatry, Psychology and Law has been one of the mainstays of the Australian New Zealand Academy of Psychiatry, Psychology and Law uh, for many years and uh, incredibly well published and encouraging of scholarly activity. Uh, but he's also a professional uh, law leader in the area of uh, mental health law and in the Victorian uh, tribunals that deal with both civil uh, and forensic law. Ian, it is a great pleasure to have you here with us. One of the themes that we thought had been often missing is consideration of the legal tribunals. Uh, that work with us over the decision making surrounding forensic patients, people found not criminally responsible and its other uh, synonyms, what the principles in law and practice are around those, how we re should relate to those and similar themes. This is clearly very timely with Bill C-14 in this country uh, and it is a pleasure to have you with us to share your erudition and consideration of these things. So uh, welcome Ian uh, it's a, and we look forward very much to hearing from you. Thank you very much and uh, congratulations uh, to those of you who have stayed the course and got to the end. Let me, uh, let me say some thank yous, first of all. Uh, I've been grateful for the generosity and the, uh, the patience uh, of uh, those who have organised the conference, Sandy in particular, but also Ron Roish, Stephen Hart, St Stephanie Penny, Richard Schneider, who's not able to be with us today. Lots of reasons to, uh, to say thank you. Uh, one of them, the, uh, the wonderful venue for dinner last night. Uh, second, uh, to, uh, to organise Melissa Etheridge, uh, that was sensational. So thank you uh, to the organisers for that. And the fireworks weren't bad either that went with the conference. So, uh, so well done to the, uh, the organisers uh, for uh, all of those things. Now you've heard from the, uh, the two other keynote presenters that they have uh, utilised musical themes to bind together uh, what they have spoken about. Uh, you've uh, you've uh, heard for uptake of Bob Dylan and also the Rolling Stones. Well, it's going to be Melissa Etheridge for me. You'll see why soon. I'm going to talk to you on the basis of, uh, of being a, uh, a Queen's Council who has represented mentally unwell people in their attempts to be reduced in supervisory status after usually having committed murder and also on the basis of being a tribunal member who's had occasion to decide on involuntary status for a variety of different kinds of patients. So it'll be those two perspectives that I weave into uh, the address to you today. I'm going to keep what I say reasonably generic, although I will touch upon particular approaches in certain jurisdictions. In 1985, Daniel Davis identified the need to restore patients found not guilty by reason of insanity to what he called functionality. The issue that I want to traverse with you today is what should be the aims of both treatment and release decision making about this small category of patients. It's a small but important category of patients, a group, of course, that tends to stay for a long while in detention. I want to reflect with you about those things which are distinctive about this group. I'm going to stay away from those who are found unfit to stand trial because they're a smaller group, difficult to assess, and uh, in some jurisdictions housed in different ways than those who are not guilty by reason of insanity or mental impairment. 
But given what we know, and particularly what we've heard about from our friends in Ireland, I want to reflect with you on what should be the realistic treatment strategies and how those strategies can intersect in a constructive way in respect of decision making about downgrading in status, the provision of leave, and ultimately discharge of such patients. Particularly looking at those factors which do and can impact upon decision making in a legitimate way. And picking up on some of what Michael Perlin said, I want to incorporate issues to do with international obligations. And I particularly want to give some thought with you to the impact of the recovery model, which is becoming so important in treatment planning in respect of mentally unwell patients more generally. So in a talk such as this, we, we need to go back really to the Hadfield decision, which of course involved the attempt to assassinate George III. The person responsible for the attempt was a, a soldier who'd been brain damaged in, uh, in battle for the Crown. He was found not guilty by reason of insanity. And at that stage, the options were very raw ones. They were either that he be released back into the community or that he be retained in prison. That dichotomy is still one which is pertinent under international criminal law because there are a number of jurisdictions which look at offending by people and don't have the option to detain them in a hospital and treat them. In Cambodia, some efforts have been made in that respect, but for instance, in the tribunals in Rwanda, uh, even in Serbia, there have been difficulties in that respect, and certainly in East Timor. Well, that's been a very practical problem. So the difficulties in 1800 persist in some respects, in some contexts, till today. But what I'm interested in in Hadfield was what was said by the Court of King's Bench in humane and in some ways very modern language, that it's absolutely necessary for the notice the safety of society, that Hadfield should be properly disposed of, all mercy and humanity being shown to this most unfortunate creature. But for the sake of a community, undoubtedly he must somehow or other be taken care of with all the attention and all the relief that can be afforded him. So there was a perspective that it was inappropriate to be harsh or punitive to a person who had been found not criminally responsible for his homicidal behavior. Well, one of the outcomes of the Hadfield case was the passage of the Criminal Lunatics Act, which allowed people to be committed to strict custody until the monarch's pleasure be known. It gave the Crown authority to make an order in that regard during the period of detention in respect of what constituted safe custody, and it resulted in the construction of Broadmoor Hospital. So an influential decision. And the concept of people being detained at Her Majesty's pleasure as it currently is, for both those found not guilty by reason of insanity and in some places called mental impairment, and as found unfit to stand trial, existed for a long while. It's been abolished in most places, in most contexts, at least notionally. But in many respects, the concept of indefinite detention until somebody, the executive, a tribunal or a court, depending on where you are, decides otherwise. So that governor's pleasure system was exported to Canada, it being the pleasure of a lieutenant governor to Australia and New Zealand, Hong Kong, Singapore, many other places beside. The United States uh, system in more latter times has allowed for automatic commitment to a hospital until a decision is made otherwise. 
And for instance, in Oregon, it's a board, the Psychiatric Security Review Board, consisting of a variety of different professionals that makes a decision in respect of release. The United States' lines of authority in this regard are interesting and somewhat different from those in a number of other countries. It's been held by the Supreme Court now some 30 years ago that the Constitution permits confinement of a person in a mental institution, as it was put then, until such time as the person has regained their sanity or, note the alternative, is no longer a danger to himself or society. So one or t'other, of course, normally there's something of a correlation between the two. The court was much more split in the Fuqua decision. And by a very bare majority, the decision was that due process required that once a person found not guilty by reason of insanity was no longer mentally ill, they have to be released, even though they may be regarded as very dangerous. Now you'd appreciate immediately that that resulted in a suite of measures to guard against persons in that category being released when that might be contrary to what was perceived to be the public interest. And so we now have just about throughout the United States, sexually violent predator laws, sexually dangerous person legislation. Travelling then to the United Kingdom, detention is to a hospital on an indefinite basis. And the courts have intervened to try to explore and explicate what that means. Perhaps not so surprisingly, it's been found that that kind of indeterminate detention lasts so long as Her Majesty, which really means the Secretary of State, considers that to be appropriate. And the courts have been at pains to explain that it's not really a punitive sentence, uh, it's a decision for the executive, and of course have stressed the importance of there not being a premature release. But in re recent times, the human rights jurisprudence coming from Strasbourg has intervened. And it did so, for instance, in respect of the two boys aged 10 who were uh, sentenced to Her Majesty's pleasure detention as a result of their killing of the little boy, James Bulger. And as part of a, a trend in this respect, what the House of Lords found was that there should be the facility for periodic review of the ongoing detention of at least young offenders, since the only justification the House of Lords found for such detention was their continuing dangerousness. And that, they said very pointedly, was something which is subject to change. In Australia, there's been much law reform in this area. The position is diverse, whereas in Canada, the law in respect of crime is national. In Australia, it's state-based. And so there are different entities which can make decisions about what occurs with people after they've been detained on an indefinite basis. Relatively few people seek to be found not guilty by reason of insanity or mental impairment in Australia unless they've committed homicide. One of the issues that pervades this area from everyone's perspective is how long people are detained upon a decision of this kind. There's a limiting term in some parts of Australia, and in others there isn't one at all. But there are mechanisms throughout the country for the level of 
status to be the subject of application for reduction and ultimately full discharge. It's in that context that I've appeared on many occasions in the Supreme Court uh, for persons who usually have spent considerable periods of time in detention. One man of whom I became rather fond had spent just on 40 years uh, in, uh, in psychiatric hospitals with minimal development of rapport with his clinicians and, and clearly continuing significant levels of symptomatology. He perturbed his uh, uh, carers inordinately on one occasion shortly before I met him by managing to give him the slip when he was on escorted leave. And he told me the tale of what he did because for reasons that weren't entirely apparent, I seemed to develop more rapport with him than uh, those in the hospital. And he told me with, uh, with a smile on his face that uh, how he'd planned it, how he'd got away from him. I said, what did you do? And he said, ah, uh, I went to my favorite beach. I got myself six beers and I sat at the water's edge and they were the best beers I've ever tasted. I said, what did you do then? He said, I went to visit my parents because they've been good to me. I said, oh, it must have been a surprise for them when you got to their front door. He'd killed two people, you see. And he said, it was, it was. I said, surprise, and they were surprised. <laughs> and they said to him, you shouldn't be here. And he said, I know, I know. They said, we're going to have to call the hospital. He said, I know, but I just wanted to come and say thank you at your house. And he sat down with them and had afternoon tea and was taken back to the hospital. Unfortunately, because of the ongoing level of his symptomatology, it is likely his schizophrenia being quite treatment resistant and his delusions still being markedly similar to those when he committed the homicides that uh, he will see out his days in that hospital. But I think of him often because uh, it seems to me that he was a man who had some elements of potential to be reclaimed, but his level of supervision, or his level of institutionalization was such that it would be extraordinarily difficult. The role in my jurisdiction for making decisions about people who have been found not guilty by reason of insanity is given to the court which sentenced them in the first place which is an interesting role because the court doesn't sit with a psychiatrist or a psychologist. It hears evidence from them, of course. And as you can see, the court is obliged not to vary a supervision order that's custodial, which is how everyone starts, to a non-custodial order or to give people extended periods of leave at least during the first half of what would have been their sentence of imprisonment, unless satisfied of a negative, that the safety of a person subject to the order or members of the public will not be seriously endangered as a result of the release of a person. It's really hard to prove a negative. And so the, uh, the journey for persons seeking significant periods of time living in the community and then as a next step to be downgraded to a non-custodial supervisory status and then ultimately applying for revocation is a long, difficult and frustrating one for them. Rather interestingly, there is now about 15 years worth of jurisprudence on the issue. The cases aren't easily accessible because the courts have formed the view that it is in the therapeutic best interests of the persons involved not to be readily identifiable 
so as to enable their integration into the community. And so many of the cases are suppressed from public access. The victims' families are allowed to put in submissions and they're notified every time an application is made for a change in status of a person. And that's a sad and painful exercise because every time that they're so notified, generally people feel an obligation to re-attend court and they have to re-experience the trauma that they've endured, usually many years before. And sometimes this can be taking place for in excess of 30 years, albeit that the applications don't come on a frequent basis. The decision-making by the court has been conservative, as you would anticipate, and properly so. It's been gradualist in its focus, insisting on a step-by-step -step provision of monitored freedom to the detainees and a review of how they fared under reduced levels of supervision, with the court focusing upon continuing symptomatology, the person's levels of insight and compliance, whether they have had significant relapses, when the symptomatology that they now have bears a relationship to that which played a role in their committing the index offence. And a concern too to evaluate whether the person is likely to be destabilised by some other issue in their life, the death of a, an important support person or a relationship going awry or misuse of substances of any kind. The pattern has been that people have made their way after periods of on-ground supervised and unsupervised leave to getting extended leave in the community on a reasonably regular basis, with some exceptions. After that, the log jams start. It's been more difficult for them to receive a non-custodial supervision order, which is comparable to a community treatment order, mandated outpatient treatment, but with extra levels of capacity to pull them back into hospital if any warning signs emerge, and with extra levels of supervision given their special status. Very few people have succeeded in being revoked. It's in the order of 10 to 12 within that time frame. And my jurisdiction has about six million people a very modest number of homicides a year, about 80 or 90, but, and a, uh, a secure, very modern facility uh, with very high walls that cannot be climbed, uh, and uh, uh, an inadequate number of beds, but the best is done with them, uh, about 116 beds. There's been an explicit acceptance that downgrading of a person's supervisory status is pro-therapeutic. And certainly my own experience of these patients is that their status as still subject to formal supervision, or put another way, in essence, still being at the governor's pleasure, weighs heavily upon them in an adverse sense, and that they experience the, co the putative coercion, at least, as something which is oppressive and something which inhibits their capacity to move forward in their recovery. So, coming to Canada. Much dates back to the important decision of the Supreme Court in Swain, now 23 years ago. In that case, it was the prosecution that raised the issue of insanity and that was contrary to the wishes of Mr. Swain. 
he was charged with various assaults on family members. He was placed at any rate into strict custody and it was held by the Supreme Court that while that was inevitable and necessary to determine his levels of ongoing dangerousness, it was mandatory that there be periodic reviews, that they could not be put off in an indeterminate way. That resulted in reforming legislation, the bill that became known as C30. And that wrought significant changes in Canada. It removed the role of the Lieutenant Governor and it brought in decision making by provincial review boards as to release. The question being when there is a significant threat to the public. So just contrast that to the uh, Australian position, for instance, where by statute there can't be a downgrading in status unless a negative is satisfied. So more liberal in many respects and mandatory review of such persons every 12 months. And the next real step was the Winko decision from the uh, Supreme Court which upheld the validity of Bill C-30 and that was on the basis that the framework that it constructed was genuinely individualised. It involved an assessment of the particular person's risk and a balancing of their various rights against those of members of the public who might be endangered. It didn't have a presumption of dangerousness and that was a core component to the legitimacy of the legislation that absence of a presumption of dangerousness. Some of the rhetoric within the Winko decision was psychiatrically informed and thoughtful and humane. The court talked about no stereotypical notions of mad criminals having been undermined by clinical research and they commented that it's not clear whether the increased rates of violent behaviour of those with psychiatric disorders may result from the illness itself or from the socially marginalising side effects of the illness. So the factors which are mandated for boards to look to bear a consistency with those existing in many different jurisdictions. And it's obviously a balancing exercise, needing to protect the public from risk, looking to the psychiatric state of the detainee, the interest of reintegrating them into the community, other needs that they might have, and an attempt to make decisions which are as minimally restrictive for them as feasible in the circumstances. But things have changed, and political pressures have been identified at any rate. When they've built up is another matter, but they've been identified and they've resulted in an impetus for reform, not a liberalising reform either. The, uh, there have been two bills which bear close similarities to each other and uh, Sandy, I think C14 comes into force on, uh, in, uh, in July, does it not? The, uh, the changes in Canada are interesting and perhaps reflective of a range of dynamics and a range of current political issues that are not confined only to Canada. The changes are predicated upon a perception that people have been being discharged too readily and that that has endangered the community by virtue of the risk of violent recidivism. And a number of measures have been utilised to address this perceived risk to the public. One has been to create a new category of persons called high risk accused. And that category is a product of when the offending was of a brutal nature, whatever exactly that means, or if there is a substantial likelihood that they'll use violence that could endanger the life or safety of another. Now these are difficult concepts because uh, 
one would think brutality is inherent in the commission of homicide most of the time, and uh, a substantial likelihood of whether a person will resort to violence that could put someone's safety at risk is a troubling concept, notwithstanding the various tests and mechanisms for guided professional judgment that we spend so much time refining and talking about at gatherings such as this. And one of the other attributes of the legislation is an attempt to reduce the frequency of hearings or a, a, a change that will bring about a reduction in such hearings where the view is that the person's condition is not likely to improve. This too is a very troubling kind of concept uh, because uh, much of the time, of course, we are talking about persons with uh, an illness uh, on the schizophrenia spectrum. And different things, as we've thought about during this conference, can result in improvements, even though they may take a long while. And I'm going to come back to that theme. Under the new legislation, public safety becomes the paramount consideration. In other words, it trumps everything else. And orders in respect of persons still to be made by the boards must now be necessary and appropriate in the circumstances rather than more geared toward the accused person, the detainee, being least onerous and as little restrictive as possible. So you can see the orientation. It's harsher. There's to be less review. On occasions, people will be, in effect, abandoned in terms of their potential for rehabilitation. And the preeminent consideration is the safety of the public rather than uh, the well-being of the patient. The notion of significant threat to the safety of the public is very broadly defined, and, and, and troublingly so, as being a risk of serious physical or psychological harm to members of the public, including any victim of or witness to the offence or anybody under the age of 18, from conduct that is criminal in nature but not necessarily violent. It's a very broad indeed. I wrestle myself with the, uh, the drafting of this and exactly what it means but that's going to be a task for the boards and in due course the appellate courts of Canada. The role of victims is enhanced so that the review boards have to notify every victim of their entitlement to file an expression of their views whenever there's any consideration being given to a change in status for the accused who's a high risk person. I'm sad and troubled to see the change in Canada because it reflects developments which are taking place in other parts of the world. And I must say I have reservations about whether these changes are going to achieve the aspirations of the legislature. It's going to make it more difficult for review boards and to integrate people gradually back into the community. And it seems to me that it's likely to shift focus away from recovery and potential recovery of patients. And that will cause significant suffering. The reality has been unedifyingly exposed just latterly in two different parts of the world that persons who are either unfit to stand trial or not guilty by reason of insanity can far too readily fall between cracks. The, uh, the Indian Supreme Court just latterly intervened in respect of the detention of a man called Machal Lalong it's a truly tragic case, and its tale is told in uh, 
an editorial that comes out this week in Psychiatry, Psychology and Law. He was found not guilty, uh, not, not fit to stand trial in 1951. He was a man of epilepsy, of uh, very little education, language uh, uh, difficulties. He'd engaged in a, uh, a low-grade assault. And uh, he was found to be mentally well a few years into his time in a psychiatric hospital. But uh, he was not released. Are you ready for this? Until 2006. And the Supreme Court was so troubled by this discovery that it undertook or ordered to be undertaken a review of whether there might be others in his category. And it found that there were multiple. And it's a different world in India. But it's illustrative of the fact that once review mechanisms are taken away, or when they become dysfunctional, or when people jump to conclusions over readily about the amenability of people to recovery, the consequences at a human level can be just awful. And let me tell you a grim tale from Australia as well, because of all the countries in the world, probably Australia bears most features in common uh, with uh, Canada. In a decision just last year, which went to Australia's highest court, the equivalent of the Supreme Court of Canada, it emerged that a man who had brain injuries had been wrongly classified to be detained indefinitely at the governor's pleasure, which was the system in place at the time. And he didn't have the ability to press his claim and argue things. His lawyers seemed to have uh, taken an appeal and been unsuccessful, and that was the end of their involvement, and they moved on to the next case. The High Court had no problem whatever in releasing him when the facts were clearly pointed out to them in 2013. The difficulty was that he'd been in prison for 27 years by that point. And this wasn't India. I think these are both stark examples of what can happen when oversight and monitoring is not clearly framed and is not mandated in explicit ways with powers given to external bodies like tribunals or courts periodically to review the situation of persons. So why, why, why make such changes? Well, we, we know the real politic. Mad people have always been regarded as frightening, and those who have killed are perceived as even more frightening. And the stereotypes and the assumptions about them are pervasive, enduring. In my own country, in Queensland, there has been a, uh, 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 a new episode of law reform uh, just latterly, uh, which uh, uh, has arisen from a perception on the part of a government very similar to the, uh, the Canadian government, that uh, too many people were making their way out of psychiatric hospitals when they ought not to be. Not based on any empirical information, but just a concern. And so the, uh, the proposal in this legislation is that all mental health inpatient facilities, not just forensic ones, but all of them, be locked to reduce the risks of ill patients absconding and presumably putting the community at risk. Uh, the government uh, uh, provided a uh, discussion paper, which was very short, and it required feedback, or it enabled feedback, for a bit less than two weeks. It's very clear what course they are embarked upon, and it's hard to imagine that any, any uh, uh, submissions will deter them from their trajectory. So what we're talking about are uninformed, fear-driven changes, which can be politically advantageous to governments. It's well-trodden territory. We, we all understand it well, correlating madness and dangerousness without any form of differentiation. Drawing upon stereotypes. And I want to explore with you now what this means for individuals. I've pointed out the Lalong and Yates cases, but I want to think through with you what risks uh, this can engender, because it doesn't just apply in 
India or Queensland or, or even Canada. But we've seen moves in this direction in the United Kingdom too. And we've heard about for very long periods of time that persons found not guilty by reason of insanity uh, remain uh, detained in Ireland. The risk is that the focus will be not upon clinical perspectives, which are informed longitudinally and by continuing and close observation and therapeutic relationship with the patient, but by other factors. So what is it that makes forensic patients different from other unwell people in the community? The well, truth is it's not much. It's usually that they've engaged in some really violent activity, often uh, in the context of those not found not guilty by reason of insanity, homicide. But any number of people have engaged in some kind of, for instance, intrafamilial violence, and for good reason or serendipity, there hasn't been a death or a really serious injury. And carers tell this tale all the time. There isn't really a bright line distinction between forensic patients and civil patients. It's simply that the forensic patients have engaged in demonstrable violence. That's come to the attention of the authorities and been dealt with by the courts. Michael Perlin talked about the, uh, the Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities. And I, I just wanted to mention Article 26 because it, 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 it provokes thoughts in me. It, it requires state parties to take effective and appropriate measures of a variety of kinds to enable those with disabilities, for instance, with psychiatric disorders, to attain and maintain maximum independence, full physical, mental, social and vocational ability, and full inclusion and participation in all aspects of life. Now there isn't a special exception for persons who are forensic patients. And that's been an advised, deliberate construction of a convention. So if a person does become well enough for release from a clinical perspective, is that in conformity with the convention if they continue to be detained? in the United Kingdom, in Ireland, in Canada, in Australia, in the United States. Well, I think Michael Perlin would say to you it's not, it's discriminatory. It's failing to give them the maximum independence to which they're entitled, and it can even potentially constitute cruel and unusual punishment, because it's no longer dangerousness related. It's for collateral reasons. Pursuing this theme a little bit further then, to think through the distinction between patients who are forensic and those who are not, could I go back to you with the recovery model, which is now our major prism through which we think about the provision of psychiatric treatment, especially in the community, but also for inpatients. It recognises the individual nature of what's often termed to be a journey. And it's directed toward recovery of hope and a sound base, a sense of self. And its notions are ones of re-inclusion and acquisition of skills. It's based, as we know, upon a 12-step program of Alcoholics Anonymous. And inherent in it is the capacity for people to gain control, meaning, and purpose in their lives. And it can have different applications for different kinds of people, but at the essence of it is the aspiration that people be able to live as full a life as is feasible for them in the community, accepting that they may well have enduring symptomatology. So the, in terms of the processes, the attempt is to uh, 
engaged a person to have a sense of ownership over their health, to have hope, to exercise control, and to become connected with mechanisms which are sustaining and rewarding within the community with the aim of their having a, a meaningful and purposeful life. And at the heart of it is evaluation of that progress by reference to sensible clinical tools. Well, what about persons who are found not guilty by reason of insanity? It's a different situation, isn't it? Do you remember the figures that we heard about the duration of detention in Ireland? And I, I, I suspect that they're familiar to most of us in a session uh, I was at just before this. Uh, it was suggested that those in the Netherlands are not all that different. Certainly people can remain as inpatients or at least under very significant uh, supervisory regulation for very lengthy periods of time, and not many people graduate right out of the system. So what's distinctive about the situation of those with that status who have been found not guilty by reason of insanity? Well, there is the length of time which engenders many other things, a hopelessness, which is palpable amongst many of the people with whom we deal. A sense that there is no real capacity to get through to another, another side, to live down what's, what they've done. And when a person is for a very long time detained in a place, however humane, however good the clinical services, the level of institutionalization of a person becomes substantial indeed and works against, militates against their capacity to reintegrate into a community. And when they're away, when they're out of sight, for such a long while, to use the terminology of last night's film, there's a risk of their being alienated from their family and their friends. Not many families are as involved and as empathic and as forgiving as Michael's that we saw last night. And one of the things that one observes is that, again, in spite of every effort by staff, the overwhelming boredom and lack of stimulation is adverse for patients, in spite of courses and programs and attempts to engage in group therapy and so on. And the guilt about what they've done as well is a profound impediment for many to recovery. And to use Professor Kennedy's terminology, there's the danger of a loss of therapeutic ambition on the part of clinicians in terms of what to do, where to move to after a period of time. And we've heard very eloquently in this conference about how much can be and often is achieved for patients in this category within the first four or five years. But what about the next five and the next five thereafter? There are a number of non-empirical indications that in fact continuing detention becomes counter-therapeutic. In fact, making it more difficult for the person to recover and thereby to reintegrate. So let me move toward a conclusion. It seems to me that moves to make detention lengthier, to ratchet up the pressures on decision-making bodies, to have regard to contributions from victims which may be powerfully and authentically experienced subjectively by the victims, but which don't add very much to the decision-making process. And to reduce oversight and make it harder for people 
who have committed very violent acts to be released are highly problematic and unlikely to be effectual in actually protecting the community. What we're seeing is a re-politicisation of an area that's so easily politicised. It's not based on actual clinical experience or on known outcomes. And that's something which every person in this room has an informed perspective about. I'm perhaps overly optimistic, but long term, I think the reasoned arguments of highly informed people can overcome prejudice and stereotypes. We just have to keep working at it. And if there is detention, which is to all intents and purposes indefinite for significant categories of persons, the La Long and the Yates cases remind us of how unjust that can be. And to move then to the recovery model, it seems to me that given that the differences really between forensic patients and those in the community are quite modest. There is much to be said for the recovery model playing a very significant role. From a clinical perspective, in both the provision of treatment and decision making about release. Hope must be maintained People need to be empowered to some degree to take responsibility for their illness, whether it be diabetes or asthma or a mental illness, because it's only in those circumstances that they will do that which is necessary for them to stay well. Put another way, maintenance of hope and provision of autonomy are pro-therapeutic. And it is a journey toward recovery for persons with mental illness, for all of them. And it needs to be enabled in a, in a real way. And the truth is, in spite of all of our instruments, with every acronym that we accord to them, prediction of risk in respect of persons who have already engaged in violence when highly symptomatic with mental illness, is a fallible process, and every now and again, there'll be an error. But people need to be enabled to make mistakes and not to be deprived of their capacity to continue on the journey. They need to be able to fall up, to fall, to pick themselves up, to keep going on the journey and it seems to me that it's our responsibility to enable that to take place. Community protection is vital. It's a fundamental consideration in this area. Protection of members of the public, family members, friends, strangers and even the person from themselves. But every clinician knows that. And every clinician accustomed to working in this area is alert to signs and has a range of tools these days to facilitate sensible, cautious decision making. But there's a correlation between recovery and risk posed. If a person is largely recovered in terms of acquisition of insight, compliance with medication, having a therapeutic alliance with clinicians, recognising danger signs, abstaining from substances which may put at risk that recovery, then if they were merely a person in the community, one would say that they posed very little risk indeed and didn't actually need very much imposition of coercion. So. Let me finish where I began. Let's go to Melissa. Let me leave you with, uh, with some of her words which I suspect are apposite in this domain. Thank you for listening to me. I appreciate your being here. Thank you.